Hi guys, so in this video we're going to be talking about characterization tools you're likely to encounter during your research this summer. We've also included a bonus slide on hot embossing. So the scanning electron microscope, or the SEM, works by shooting electrons out of an electron gun and measuring the electron backscatter, or as secondary electrons. So this technique is, has nanometer scale resolution and it's a way of visualizing feature profiles or surfaces of materials. So Basically, we start with an electron gun, and these con condenser lenses help focus the electron beam. And so the backscatter electron detector is used to measure elastic collisions of electrons with higher energy electrons. And it's really good at helping us uh, d determine chemical contrast. So uh, heavy elements actually appear brighter in SEM images. And so backscatter electron is really good at for identifying chemical compositions in an SEM sample. Secondary electron detectors uh, measure electrons that are close to the sample surface and this is um, and it allows us to get this nanometer scale resolution of these features. So on this next slide I have examples of some awesome SEM images. Um, so SEM is actually only in black and white but a lot of times people in publications will color it. This is not actually how they appear. But you can see how we're able to see these uh, the surfaces of these features. Or here you can see like the ant antenna. Most SEM images that you see in literature will have a scale bar. So here you can see that the scale bar is one micrometer. So you can see that the length of this feature right here is about, um, it looks like 1.5 micrometers. So it's really important that you guys use standard scale bars and report all your scale bars in the SEM images that you take. The main disadvantage of SEM is because we're using electrons and measuring their backscatter and secondary electrons, the samples have to be conductive, which means that a lot of times, like for example, polymers that aren't very conductive, we have to coat them with gold or um, platinum, radium, something that will help make it conductive so that the SEM can see it. This becomes a problem, especially at the nanometer length scale, because these coatings have to be on the order of eight nanometers. And so say you have like a 10 nanometer feature, coating it with an eight nanometer coating um, isn't very viable for getting great feature measurements. In addition, the samples have to be isolated in a vacuum. So a lot of times when people are imaging uh, maybe really large templates, they have to break the template. Um, you have to do certain steps of sample preparation to actually be able to see it. And the other thing is that the SEMs aren't very high throughput process. So high throughput, meaning how much we can turn over or the rate at which we can do something, um, is really slow in the SEM because we usually can mount maybe five samples at once and then the scans the raster scans of each sample are done individually. And it takes a long time to actually calibrate the samples and get the resolution that you want. So um, SEM is definitely art. It takes practice. And as you do it this summer, you'll get better at it. Um, um, and you can learn other different, more um, creative techniques to either get the samples more conductive um, or get um, higher resolution. Um, oh, and one last point to make about the SEM is that because we're firing electron beams at the sample, sometimes the electron beams can actually damage the surface. So I mentioned polymer films. A lot of times when you're working with the polymer, the electron beam can burn through the film and you can see the film burning with the polymer burning or, or whatever soft surface you have burning as you're imaging it. So in this way, SEM can sometimes be destructive, which is important to take into account with any characterization technique is how your characterization is um, modifying your sample. The next technique we're going to be talking about is called atomic force microscopy or AFM. AFM, like SEM, allows us to achieve a spatial image of our sample with nanometer scale resolution. In AFM, we use a sharp tip and we tap or drag it across the surface. And these tips are commonly made out of materials like silicon nitride. Um, just so you know, when we drag our tip across the surface, we're in what's called contact mode, and when we tap it across our surface, we're in tapping mode. But as we drag or tap our tip across the surface, we can measure the force of interaction between the tip and the sample. And this force is governed by Hooke's Law, which as we may recall, Hooke's Law says that the force needed to compress or expand a spring by some distance is proportional to that distance. And this is governed or related to the material spring constant. We can measure the deflection of our tip, or another word for tip is cantilever, uh, with a laser light. So by shining a laser on our cantilever, we can measure the deflection and then use Hooke's Law to calculate the force of interaction. Using this data, we can then generate a 3D map of what it would look like. 
Um, as you can see from this image on the right, um, I've shown a hexagonal unit cell of graphite. And you can see here that uh, we can get a three-dimensional, this is a 2D image, but we could also use the same data to get a three-dimensional image. XPS, or X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, is a technique commonly used to analyze the chemical composition of a sample. And it's something that I actually use very heavily in my own research. XPS is so sensitive that it can probe just 2 to 5 nanometers into the surface. And because it's so sensitive, it must be operated under ultra-high vacuum conditions. As we've mentioned before, there's a bunch of carbon and oxygen, a little bit of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And so we want to operate under UHV so that these contaminants don't interfere with our measurements. Um, not only can XPS identify the elements that are on, in your material, but they can also, it can also be used to analyze chemical composition. The way it works is that X-rays are X-rays hit the surface of your sample. And then any photoelectron in the material that has less energy than the X-ray it's being hit with is ejected. We can then use the electron energy analyzer, which was the big hemisphere that you saw on the previous slide, to analyze the kinetic energy of each photoelectron emitted. And what it produces is this something, something like this on the left. So you can see here from this spectra that we have oxygen, tin, nitrogen, carbon, silicon, and even some fluorine on the surface of this dirty silicon wafer. We can take this spectra and analyze the area underneath each of these peaks to derive the elemental composition or stoichiometry of the material. So by stoichiometry, I just mean the ratio of each element on the surface. A technique commonly used to measure the thickness of a sample is called ellipsometry. It can also be used to determine the optical constants, such as the refractive index or the extinction coefficient of your material. Um, we can also use ellipsometry to model multiple layers. So let's say I have titanium nitride on top of hafnia on top of silica. I can model them with ellipsometry. The way ellipsometry works is that we shine a light onto the material and we then analyze the change in polarization of that light. Um, polarization is characteristic of that material. So depending on the material you're analyzing, um, the light will either be reflected, absorbed, or refracted. Um, we measure this, we measure the change in polarization at various angles, and then using this data we can generate a model that tells us the thickness and these other optical properties. So I also wanted to talk about hot embossing, since we're, um, it, which is another type of lithography technique. So uh, hot embossing is a special type of imprint lithography in which a stamp is pressed into a thermoplastic material to define the desired pattern. So in this image, this, the desired pattern is the words IMT, or the letters IMT. And so basically, the stamp is pressed down onto the polymer mold, and temperature and pressure is applied underneath the stamp um, in a controlled heat and pressure cycle so that the polymer is actually heated above its glass transition temperature. So for those of you who don't know what a glass transition temperature is, it's the point at which a material becomes um, changes from its brittle state to um, its more malleable soft state so that the polymer can actually be molded. Then the polymer is cooled back down to below its glass transition temperature so it becomes brittle again, and the stamp is lifted. And so in this way we're left with our features. All right, guys, that concludes our video presentations. Thank you so much for watching all of them. We hope to continue adding more content, but if you have any suggestions or comments, please let us know.